Hey everyone, I am Magical Hacker, and this is episode number 14 of the Eminence Podcast, the non-CEDH Commander Podcast where I help you in the command zone with your deck building skills and on the battlefield with your deck piloting skills. This podcast is brought to you by Unspoken Blood and the rest of my patrons at patreon.com slash magicalhacker. Today's topic, chosen by Unspoken Blood, is the question, is Mycosynth Lattice plus Titania Song and similar combos good or bad in Commander? So this is a, uh, a type of combo that is considered a lock, where the combo itself doesn't necessarily win you the game, like we can think of for infinite combos, but what it does do <clears throat> is it makes it impossible for you to lose the game, and as a result, that means that you're w- you will win the game, it's just not caused directly by this combination of cards, but rather indirectly by it. It's making it so that your opponents can't do anything, or at least not do anything uh, that's likely, or you know, sometimes there are ways to get around these cards, but in general, they're not going to have an answer to this combo, to this lock. It'll lock them from playing the game, and so that way you'll be able to win. So let's talk about the combos specifically, starting off with what I would say is probably the the key card here, because I can't really seem to find anything that is a replacement for this card in the combos that it works with. So I want to talk about this card first, and this is Mycosynth Lattice. It's a six mana colorless artifact that says, all permanents are artifacts in addition to their other types. All cards that aren't on the battlefield, spells, and permanents are colorless, and players may spend mana as though it were mana of any color. So essentially with this card, we've got three abilities. The last ability here making it so that colors don't matter. You can use white mana to cast black spells, and you can use all this mana. Now this card is legal in Commander. It's bo- it's banned in Modern, which I think is, is interesting. It does talk about its power, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it does allow you to spend mana as though it mana may- of any color. That ability isn't what's vital to the lock here. The second ability here, same thing. Uh, spells being colorless, permanents being colorless, cards that aren't on the battlefield being colorless, those aren't really affecting the uh, the ability of this card to combo. It's the first ability that is the key ability here. All permanents are artifacts in addition to their other types. Notably, this does not say all non-land permanents. And if it did say that, it wouldn't be... I don't think it would be banned. I don't think it would be... Um, Uh, a topic of conversation because that one element the fact that it turns your opponent's lands into artifacts into their in addition to the other types that's what makes this card combo so well now the other uh card mentioned in the title of the topic of this episode that was given to me by unspoken blood is titania song let's go ahead and read off that one as well it's a four mana green enchantment that says each non-creature artifact loses all abilities and becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness, each equal to its mana value. It also has an ability here, if Titania Song leaves the battlefield, this effect continues until end of turn, which is really cool. I I like that a lot. But going to the first sentence here, it's doing two things that are both allowing you to lock your opponents out of the game. First of all, it's making it so that uh, your opponent's lands that are artifacts here, and they're non-creatures, they now uh, have a mana value uh, they, they have their power and toughness changed to their mana value. So they go from being non-creature artifact lands to now being 0-0 zero, zero artifact creature lands, which, as you know, will Im- make them immediately go to the graveyard for uh, due to state-based actions. So that works pretty well. But what about an opponent that has, let's say, they have an Anthem effect? All creatures you control get plus one, plus one. That would mean that their lands would survive. They would be one ones. The first ability, or the first part of the sentence here, <clears throat> does take that out of the uh, of the equation by saying each non-creature artifact loses all abilities. So even if those lands do stick around on the battlefield for whatever reason, they still can't activate for mana. In fact, not being able to, to activate for mana is one of the other ways that people typically associate as a combo or a lock with Mycosynth Lattice. So Karn the Great Creator is one such example. It's a four mana colorless planeswalker. Has a couple of abilities. It enters with five of loyalty. I won't read all of the abo- uh, abilities here just yet, but I do want to read the static ability on this card. It says activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. So this is an example of a way that you can turn off your opponents from being able to use the abilities on their lands 
in combination with Mycosynth Lattice. This is actually the card that resulted in the uh, ban of Mycosynth Lattice from Modern because it has another ability here. It says minus two, you may reveal an artifact card you own from outside the game or choose a face-up artifact card you own in exile, put that card into your hand. So they were, you know, a lot of players were putting Mycosynth Lattice in their sideboard, getting it out of their sideboard with Karn the Great Creator. So this was in, in essence a one card lock that you could play in any deck because it's colorless. All you have to do is have Mycosynth Lattice in your sideboard. You play down the Karn, you minus to it, then you cast the Mycosynth Lattice and now your opponents can't cast anything anymore because their lands can't be activated. So it, were, it was certainly something that was very, very powerful. The other ability here on Karn is a plus one. It says, until your next turn, up to one target non-creature artifact becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness, each equal to its mana value. So it's doing something very similar to Titania Song and similar to something that you know other cards are doing. March of the Machines is a blue enchantment. Also uh, makes your opponent's... Uh, and your artifacts that are not creatures turns them into creatures with power and toughness each equal to its mana value. Sidri Galvanic Genius is an Esper colored three drop commander that has a mana uh, ability, or excuse me, has an uh, activated ability for one mana that you can target something and turn it into a creature. Target some artifact that's not a creature, turn it into a creature with power and toughness each equal to its mana value. Karn Silver Golem, a colorless legendary artifact creature that costs five mana. Has a similar ability, also for one mana, does the exact same thing. So there are a lot of abilities in Magic that can either turn all non-creature artifacts into creatures with power and toughness, each equal to its mana value, or target something that does that. So it's targeting one non-creature artifact at a time to turn those into creatures with power and toughness, each equal to their mana value. So with these types of cards... You can certainly combo with Mycosynth Lattice. Of course, Titania Song, by working on two axes, works really well. Karn the Great Creator, again, working on two axes makes it really uh, effective, uh, really easy to use. But there are certainly other options that are in this category. Now, there are more options that do the same thing as Karn the Great Creator by turning off activated abilities of artifacts. Collector Oof, two mana, uh, two... Two mana green creature says activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. Uh, we have Stony Silence, two mana white enchantment says the same thing. Null Rod, two mana uh, colorless artifact says the same thing. Uh, Damping Matrix, three mana colorless artifact says the same thing. It also works against creatures, so it turns off their activated abilities as well. So we've got at least five options here that are doing the same thing as Karn the Great Creator. You could technically be playing all five of these if you're having at least green and white in your. Uh, in your deck. And if you're playing Titania Song, then you certainly have already one of those colorless, one of those colors in your deck. So, so far we've talked about two different categories of uh, cards that can combo with Mycosynth Lattice to turn it into a lock. We've talked about things that will turn non-creature artifacts into 0-0 zero, zero creatures. We've talked about cards that make it so that activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. There is a third and possibly the most well-known type of combo, um, which is when you destroy each artifact your opponent controls. So that will include their lands. And there are lots of options here if you also include things that just destroy all artifacts across the board. But the reason I'm not talking about them right now is because I feel that unlike the other two categories, if you do something like that, I don't see how you actually go on to win the game. If you destroy all artifacts and everything is an artifact, you've just wiped away the whole board. That's not necessarily a lock. That's just everybody's now having nothing. So, you know, there are certainly ways to make it work. You play it with a bunch of indestructible permanents so that they can't be destroyed, but not going to go into that for today because that's something that really is specific to what one individual deck wants to do. So let's talk about two cards that I think uh, fall into the category of getting rid of all artifacts, but only the artifacts you don't control. Starting off with Vandal Blast. It's a one mana sorcery that says destroy target artifact you don't control. Importantly, it does have an overload cost of five that says you may cast this spell for its overload cost. If you do, change its text by replacing all instances of target with each. So if you pay five mana, instead this is a sorcery that says destroy each artifact you don't control. Now, this is a card that's really, really powerful, even without the Mycosynth Lattice. Um, and there's another card that does something very similar, uh, if not possibly better in some situations. 
which is Consulate Crackdown. This is a card from Ether Revolt, and I honestly am surprised that Vandal Blast is so heavily played and Consulate Crackdown is not, even though they're they're doing very similar things. So Consulate Crackdown is a white enchantment that says, when Consulate Crackdown enters the battlefield, exile all artifacts your opponents control until Consulate Crackdown leaves the battlefield. So one benefit of Vandal Blast over Consulate Crackdown is that, you know, opponents can get their artifacts back if they destroy the Consulate Crackdown. And one benefit of the Consulate Crackdown is that if your opponents are playing a, a deck that wants their artifacts to be destroyed or they're getting artifacts back from their graveyard, well, Consulate Crackdown gets around that. One interesting point about Consulate Crackdown that actually makes that first negative not quite so bad is that opponents typically don't remove it if you're removing a lot of permanents from multiple players. Uh, because they might say, and I want to get my permanents back, but by doing so, I then help two or one of my opponents to get a lot of things for free. And so I don't want to get rid of the Consulate Crackdown. That's been my experience. I've played this card in the majority of my white decks. Um, I can't say since it came out because it, I, didn't, I didn't recognize the power of it either immediately. Uh, but since I started playing it, which has been at least a couple of years, maybe three or four years at this point, um, I've been playing this and I've never seen anybody blow it up with targeted removal, ever. And so I don't think that actually is something that we have to, to, to keep in mind. It may be the case in your playgroup, but anyways, regardless, Vandal Blast and Constant Crackdown both com uh, combo with Microsynthlatus in order to remove all permanents your opponents control without removing any of yours. Interestingly, Consulate Crackdown also gets rid of the indestructible permanents. So if opponent thinks, you know, I'm not worried because I've got something that makes all my lands indestructible. I'm not worried about the Mycosynth Lattice plus Vandal Blast combo. And then you can come around with the Consulate Crackdown and still get rid of them. And so that combined with Mycosynth Lattice can be very, very effective. Um, one interesting thing, though, these do have to be cast after the Mycosynth Lattice, unlike the previous categories of cards which you can get those down first and then get the Microsynth Lattice down afterwards. So that's just something to keep in mind with, with these uh, particular cards. Okay, so we've talked about three categories of cards with Microsynth Lattice. Certainly they're, they're very powerful. They can be very effective. They can get around a lot of uh, things that opponents might be doing to prepare and plan for uh, a combo like this. But what's the downside? With every particular card, there's always a downside. And in this case, I think there's at least two, maybe three downsides. I like to talk about two downsides two, two downside, uh, sides in this podcast. So the first downside is that Mycosynth Lattice is one of the, those cards that just really is a big red alarm for a lot of opponents. They'll be looking at the Mycosynth Lattice, and they are aware of many, if not all, of these uh, locks. So by seeing a Mycosynth Lattice either on the battlefield, in your graveyard... Somehow they are searching through your library or in your hand, they see it, right? Those are all going to set off the alarm bells. And so they may try to get you out of the game before you can really do anything and make it so that you can't do this lock against them. Because they know as soon as you get that locked down, you'll probably have the game in your favor. And so you can't lose at that point. So they're going to try to get around that by making sure you do lose before you can't lose, if that makes sense. This is the same issue that happens with mass land destruction. Mass Land Destruction is similarly a lock where you lock down the board to what its current state is. So if you find yourself at a position where you you know have the highest advantage to win based on what are, what's on the board, which happens often in Commander, there's this ebb and flow of who is most likely to win based on the current board state. If you can find yourself in a situation where you are the most likely, and then you follow it up with a mass land destruction, you lock that advantage into place. And so now an opponent can't ebb and flow and, and get their position higher than yours. So mass land destruction has a similar dynamic with the game theory of how players will respond to it once they recognize that being in your deck. Microsynth Lattice has that same downside. If an opponent sees it, they're going to be very uh, wary of it. They're going to be very interested to make sure that you lose before they lose. But there is a secondary uh, issue. Microsynth Lattice makes your permanents into artifacts as well. So if any opponent is playing any of these cards in their deck, then they can lock you out of the game. So there is a downside here that may be kind of hidden. Now, are any of these cards heavily played? And I think we can definitely say absolutely some of them are very heavily played. And I think the, 
the biggest, the best example is Vandal Blast. Out of all red cards in the entire format, it is the sixth most common red card played in red commander decks. And in fact, of the 188,624 red decks on edhrec.com, it is played in 18% of them, which is... Uh, this doesn't make sense. I'm sorry, I have this all the uh, backwards. Out of the 1,047,865 red decks that are on EDH Rec, it is played in 18% of them, which uh, results in 188,624 decks playing Vandal Blast. Now, EDH Rec is not going to be the perfect example of what you'll be experiencing, but I think it's an important guideline that we can utilize that information to help us make better decisions. With so many people playing Vandal Blast, I think it's a big risk to this combo. In fact, it might be such a big risk that the best way to play this combo is all in one turn. Uh, in the case of Vandal Blast or Consulate Crackdown, you've got to get those cards on the battlefield at the same time with, with Mycocentralitis. You can't wait one turn between the two spells. And in the case of the other cards, you have to cast those cards before the Mycocentralitis unless you are okay with playing Mycocentralitis and that card in the same turn. And so that's one thing to consider here. It makes that lock a little bit harder to use. Because um, let's say you have the Microsoft Lattice, but you don't have the combo piece. You may say, I have to wait until I draw that other combo piece before I get the Microsoft Lattice down because of the risk that someone else will Vandal Blast me. And again, that's not including all the other ways you can destroy artifacts, like the card by force. Costs X and a red. It's a sorcery that says destroy X target artifacts. So if an opponent has that in their deck, then they can destroy just your lands or just your permanents with the Microsynthlatus out on the battlefield. So there are a lot of things to consider when it comes to this combo. It certainly is very powerful, but there's a lot of risk involved. And if that's not the risk that you want to have, then either A, don't play this style of combo or this style of lock at all, or B, play a different uh, combination of cards that works similarly, but is a lot more resilient to that, and maybe a lot less well-known. I'd love to talk about uh, uh, two other uh, types of combos that do the same thing in the same way. And of course, there's you know probably hundreds of ways to lock your opponents out of the game. We're not going to go through all of the locks, but I do want to talk about two types that are very similar. And so the first one involves Enchanted Evening. This is a five-mana enchantment uh, that's in white and blue that says... All permanents are enchantments in addition to their other types. So this has a similar ability, but now instead of turning everything into artifacts plus whatever they're already, we have now enchantments instead. Now, the question is, do we have things that turn off activated abilities from enchantments? No, we don't. Do we have things that can turn enchantments into creatures? Yes, we do have one such card, but there's only one, right? There's not this you know, long list of other cards that are doing the same thing. We've got just one. It's Opalescence, four mana white enchantment that says each other non-aura enchantment is a creature in addition to its other types and has base power and toughness each equal to its mana value. So with Opalescence combined with the Enchanted Evening, you can turn all of your opponent's lands into dead creatures and then everything else becomes a creature uh, with mana value determining its power and toughness. Now, you've you've got the Enchanted Evening and the Opalescence, so you've at least got the Enchanted Evening being a 5-5. That may not be enough for you to win the game, but in combination with the rest of your deck, probably also being themed around enchantments, you can certainly get to the point where you're able to win the game from there. There are two other cards, though, that similarly work with Enchanted Evening. Uh, these are also two old cards, just like Opalescence. The first is Calming Verse. It's a four mana green sorcery that says destroy all enchantments you don't control. Then if you control an untapped land, destroy all enchantments you control. So as long as you tap out for this card, you can use this as essentially a Vandal Blast that's just for enchantments. Uh, similarly, we've got Cleansing Meditation that works very similarly, except you, this time you need Threshold. So it says this. It's a three mana white sorcery that says destroy all enchantments Threshold, if seven or more cards are in your graveyard, instead, destroy all enchantments, then return all cards in your graveyard destroyed this way to the battlefield. So Cleansing Meditation has an additional benefit in that <clears throat> you have all of your lands, which are enchantments, and uh, uh, they're going to get destroyed by this card, 
they're going to then be returned to the battlefield and in many cases untapped so you actually can net mana off of a cleansing meditation unlike calming verse but if you're playing calming verse cleansing meditation opalescence and enchanted evening all in a bant enchantment based deck you have the same opportunity to uh, combo off and lock your opponent out of the game like you can with a mycosynth lattice but those three cards that combine with the enchanted evening not only are they way less played than many of the cards I mentioned here that combo with Microsynth Lattice, Enchanted Evening and these cards are not as big uh, red flags. Your opponents are going to see them, and they are, they're not going to think two thoughts about them, about them being part of a lock combo, except for some individual players who are really adept at, at noticing these things. But in general, this is not going to be the, uh, the, the result when you play these cards. There is one more combo, <clears throat> and for this one, there's only uh, uh, one card in each category, so it may not be a reliable enough combo to use in Commander, but I still like to talk about it just in case. We've got Painter's Servant. This is a two-mana colorless artifact creature that when it enters the battlefield, you choose a color, and all cards that aren't on the battlefield, all spells, and all permanents are the chosen color in addition to their other colors. If you choose, for example, white... And so now all permanents are white in addition to their other colors. You can then play Anarchy. It's a four mana sorcery that says destroy all white permanents. And there may be other cards that work similarly to Anarchy that work specifically for, let's say, blue permanents or green permanents or black or whatever. Um, I just happened to find this one card and I didn't see anything else. I didn't do a very exhaustive search for that. But this is a great example here of another card that you can use. Now this one is... Maybe a lot of the, the downsides of the Mycosynth version and combined with the downsides of the Enchanted Evening, not a lot of cards that you can use to combo. And Painter Servant is very heavily recognized as a combo piece in other combos. Not for, not for this one, but for other things. So you still have that same red alarm effect. So that would say, you know, we're looking at all these combos just to give you the great takeaway. Playing the Mycosynth Lattice Locks are effective powerful and probably pretty uh, reliable it's easy to get them in a game however the fact that mycosynth lattice is a red alarm effect causing your opponents to be very afraid of you and the fact that vandal blast and many of the other cards that combo with it are so uh, popular in commander all those things combine to say that mycosynth lattice high risk high reward that's the way i would categorize it Painter's Servant is also what I would count a, a high risk, but maybe not so high of a reward because you've got to have, you know, one of a few of other cards that work with it and you still have that, that downside of your opponents recognizing it as a combo piece. Maybe not as high risk as the Mycosynth Lattice versions, but still something that's not the best option. If I had to pick the best option, I would say the Enchanted Evening combos uh, are the best locks of these three where you can combine it with either opalescence with calming verse or with cleansing meditation and that will allow you to, to lock the game in a way that your opponents can't lock you out of the game easily or often and you uh you won't be setting off alarm bells by playing any of those four cards so that's my take if you disagree or if you have anything else you'd like to add comments or questions please visit at twitter.com slash magical underscore underscore hacker where you can leave me a tweet or find this episode on youtube.com slash magical hacker mtg and you can leave a comment there. Speaking of which, let's take a look at some of the comments that you all left for me. Now, uh, Jerhavon is one of my uh, 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 many, uh, longtime listeners and so he's left a good number of comments uh, and, and questions. We'll talk about them in a future episode, but let's just go ahead and skip past those and we'll come back to them uh, at a later time. So we're going to go down here to where we last left off, um, right here. Okay, so Felipe Bronco left me a comment on episode number six, when are controversial win cons appropriate? And he said, I completely agree with your assessment. Nice podcast. I appreciate the kind words, Felipe, and I'm glad that you agree. I think there's uh, there's certainly times where those win conditions are appropriate or inappropriate, and so I'm glad that we're in agreement there. Uh, next comment here on episode number eight is Boompile still good or now bad in Commander? Isha says, at first glance, I dismissed Boompile. I didn't think it was all that great aside from the Avacyn synergy, but I guess I didn't give it a fair shake. I'm a believer now. Well, thank you so much for the kind words as well, Isha. 
I would love to hear your experiences with Boompile by playing it the way that I outlined in that podcast and trying to utilize it in a way to give yourself the most advantage in a way that's hard for your opponents to interact with. I think that's the best way to play Boompile, and so I'd love to hear your experiences with it and how it works out for you. Uh, Casey Spark, back on episode number six, when are controversial win cons appropriate, says, thanks for running this episode for me. I really appreciate it. And I have to say, I really appreciate you as well, Casey Spark. Um, Casey Spark, one of my uh, uh, patrons, was able to choose the topic for the episode. Now, if you're interested, of course, I mention this in every show, but if you're interested in choosing the topic for one of these episodes, um, I would love to, to, to see what you guys can think up for me to, to discuss. And you can just visit me at patreon.com to, uh, to be a part of that as well. Let's do a couple more here. Felipe Bronco on episode 9, how do you build a commander deck from 0 cards to 100 cards, says, nothing resonates more with what you said. Building a deck is an art. I always tell my wife this when she asks why I need so many cards. Building a deck, my canvas, requires ink, the cards, so I can develop my art. I have a particular love for budget decks because restriction breeds creativity. I have 48 decks to my name so far. Felipe, I would have to say I'm, I'm a full agreement there. Sometimes I build decks just because I enjoyed the process of building the deck and the art of it, the creativity of it. Playing the deck is an additional benefit. It's like the, the cherry on the top, if you will. But building the deck itself is what I enjoyed. Actually, on my Twitter channel or on my Twitter um, thread uh, recently, I posted how much I would love to be part of like a group of content creators that play decks on Magic Online because... I would love to have restrictions on my own decks that are symmetrical to the restrictions my opponents are playing, placing on their decks. And so uh, it was a response to a comment made by Saffron Olive of MTG Goldfish where he said um, there used to be, you know, back in the day, you would have to have a certain number of cards from a set. And I said, you know, I would love to play a game of Commander where at least 33 non-lands from the deck has to be from the newest uh, set and its associated sets and the commander has to be from that set as well and that's very reminiscent of commander versus and many of these other content creators that like to showcase the new sets with their episodes so i was like you know well what would i build i, I didn't even know and so i ended up just for fun building a malkator deck that's uh, one of the uh, commanders from uh, all will be one the white blue uh, commander from that set and I said, you know, I would love to build this, and I, I did include 33 other non-lands in the deck, including some lands from the from the sets as well. I really enjoyed it, and so I have to agree, Felipe, it really does feel like an art where you can express your creativity and um, and, and be, uh, be creative in the way that you're building the deck. Let's do one more question here. Savino Balducci on episode number 10, Should the Mulligan Rules of Magic Be Changed? says, I think your idea is good to prevent non-games, but I also think that it would become too easy to sculpt the perfect hand with lands, ramp, and card draw, and it would result in people being more lazy in deck building in general and in the count of essentials categories. So I responded here, and, I, and sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but I said, even if we assume that those types of hands lead to worse gameplay, which I'm not fully convinced is the case, I would argue that it's much easier to currently obtain a perfect hand since the London Mulligan allows you to try for a hand that has card draw and or ramp, whereas this system is more punishing to running too few of something, since if you don't get it in your top 12, you have no chances to get it via a mulligan, which is different than what we've got right now. And Savino replied, the fact is, it's not hard at all to find one of each in a 12 card hand. The current system allows you to see more cards, but the downside is real, the risk is there. So I definitely see where Savino is coming from in this um, in this case, where when we're talking about the current mulligan system versus the proposed mulligan system, which I talk about in that video at length, um, there are certain benefits to one side versus the other. On one hand, we may say that it's easier to find cards right now with the mulligan system that we have, because if you don't see it in your opening hand, you can mulligan again, and you can mulligan again, and keep mulliganing until you find what you want. And that makes it uh, kind of a negative, right? It's it's a little easier to combo. It's a little easier to find those silver bullets. It's a little bit easier to do all these things that a lot of players don't find all that fun in terms of gameplay. So with the replacement rule that I suggested where you wouldn't have mulligans and instead your opening hand would be limited to whatever is in the top 12 cards of your deck, I really do feel that this is way more punishing to um, any players who are choosing to run 
lower amounts of a particular card in their deck. Because let's say you have four cards in your deck that are card draw. I, I don't say that's enough card draw unless your commander is also doing cards, uh, card draw. But let's assume for this uh, scenario that your commander does not involve card draw at all. And you're only playing four cards in the deck that allow you to draw more cards. Well, if you have a uh, mulligan system where we have it right now, if you don't see any card draw in your opening hand, no problem. You can just mulligan it away and keep going until you find at least one card of card draw. So by playing too few of them, you can still guarantee that you find card draw in your opening hand by just abusing the mulligan system that we have right now in order to do so. However, if you're only playing four cards in your card draw, uh, four cards of card draw in your deck, when you draw 12 cards off the top of your deck, that makes it too low of a chance that you'll find cards that allow you to draw cards. And because of that, you're, you're out of luck. You can't find the card draw because you can't mulligan it away. So I would say that my proposed system for that reason would be more punishing to people who play lower amounts of essentials in their decks. Card draw, lands, that sort of thing. So that's the way I would place it here for, for episode 10. And I would say that probably... Uh, takes up all the time that we have for questions again if you want to pick the topic for an episode of the eminence podcast check out patreon.com slash magical hacker in fact the question for the next episode will be what should be the number of poison counters that are lethal in multiplayer commander so make sure to subscribe on youtube or follow on spotify to get notified of that episode and other episodes when they come out thank you again to unspoken blood thank you to all of my patrons 